Okay, this may be a little awkward for the at-home viewers because I may have to scroll up and down in the work that we're considering to read some passages. Because what I want to do with this Epictetus selection is uh, really get your impressions of it. Okay? I want to know what you think he's saying. Because what we have here is a handbook. It is a collection of adages, advice on how to live a life free from disturbance and emotional affliction. Okay? Now, of course, this is the introduction to philosophy course in which I attempt to focus on the history of metaphysics and ontology. But given that we began with Socrates, we have already seen how an ethical perspective on living can be connected to a metaphysical conception of things. Remember, for Socrates, in order to know how I ought to live, I must have some understanding of what I am okay? so that I don't <coughs> render a mistake in judgment about what it means to be a good person. Okay? And likewise, for Epictetus, I think that very basic to his teaching is the idea that the reason for our suffering is when we mistake appearance for reality. Okay? So even though here, as with Socrates, <coughs> are really the only two places where this particular course enters into <coughs> ethical territory or the philosophical investigation into what it means to live a good life. It does serve to demonstrate how any good philosopher will have a unified thinking, whereby the ethics, the metaphysics, the epistemology all arise from a, a basic insight. Okay. So this work by Epictetus is called the Enchiridion, and that literally does mean something like a handbook. It's sort of like an owner's manual for your life. And Epictetus was born into slavery. So knowing that, I think we're in a better position to appreciate why he finds it so important to be able to distinguish between two different kinds of situation. And what are those? Ones that you control and behave in the rest of the world and what they do. And they're not Good. The underlying teaching here is that I must be able to discern that which is within my control from that which is not within my control. Now, of course, Epictetus is writing in the second century. Okay. But this idea should be familiar to you. In fact, there's a very popular prayer 
which says essentially the same thing. And what is that? Serenity, serenity prayer. prayer. Right? The Lord's Prayer, I think, is the Our Father. Yeah. Right? The serenity Prayer says what? God grant me the serenity to do what? Accept the things that I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Okay? Because if I confuse the things over which I have no control for things over which I do have control, then I am doomed to frustration and to suffering. Yes? I'm just like going on deeper into it. Like I found like this, uh, an acronym to help you in terms of the concept of what you're talking about. The acronym, acronym is EROS. So event equals the response, which equals the outcome. And it was saying how like so many people like go through life thinking that the event equals the outcome, but then they don't keep in mind their response to it. That's an outstanding analysis. Okay. I like that a lot. So we've got the event, the response, and the outcome. And you are exactly right to say that what Epictetus wants us always to bear in mind is that the event really has no direct correlation to the outcome. Because the only thing which has power either to harm us or to help us is how we respond to the things that happen to us. Or in his words, how we think about the things that happen to us. Our attitude the judgment that we render about the things that happen to us. Now, of course, you can understand that for a child born into slavery, what other way is there to deal with captivity than to accept that it is not within your control to be freed. And what Epictetus, I think, realized is that, in fact, freedom, in its deepest sense, has nothing to do with whether your physical body is in captivity. Freedom has to do with how we think about the things that happen. Okay. Now this is a this is a long work. We're relatively longer than most of the things I've asked you to read, and certainly there's far more in here that I than I could reasonably cover in you know a day's discussion, but. There are some highlights which I've tried to paraphrase in the lecture notes I uploaded a couple of days ago, okay? And those are my paraphrases. And you can easily tell which bullet point comes from which number adage, okay? Uh, some of them I didn't comment on. Okay. But as is always the case, I would say that the best strategy for understanding a philosophical perspective or insight or system which can get complicated is to grasp the basic insight. There is always a fundamental teaching. Remember in Plato, 
once you understand the basic idea that our world is a reflection of an ideal realm, then the more complex pieces fall into place. Okay? And we've already acknowledged one of these basic teachings from Epictetus. The distinction between what I can control and what I cannot. So beginning with the very first adage or aphorism, whatever you want to call it, he says some things are in our control and others are not. Things in our control are opinion, pursuit, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever are our own actions. And it's interesting that he calls desire and aversion actions within our control. Because we typically hear people say things like, well, you know, you can't control your desires or what you, you know, what the heart wants. But Epictetus seems to be suggesting that we do have some measure of control over that which we desire. Just as Socrates did. Because once we come to understand the difference between what is really good and that which only appears to be good, then we will no longer desire mere appearances. Okay? Continuing, he writes, things not in our control, our body, property, reputation, command, and in a word, whatever, are not our own actions. So what does he mean by saying that among the things not in our control are body? Like aging? Sure. Certainly, I do have some measure of control over my body, see? But I don't control the genes that I carry. I may live a life completely free of, you know, chemical corruption, you know, a, a healthy life, and because I carry a gene, end up becoming very sick at a young age, and I don't have control over that. But if you forget that you don't have control over that, then you're destined to suffer. <clears throat> now he goes on to say, okay. that the things in our control are by nature free, unrestrained, unhindered. Okay. So what I can control is free. And not free necessarily in the sense of not costing me anything, <coughs> but freeing that which is within my control is the domain of my freedom. But those not in our control are weak and slavish, restrained, belonging to others. Remember then, that if you suppose that things which are slavish by nature are also free, and that what belongs to others is your own, then you will be hindered. You will lament 
you will be disturbed and you will find fault both with gods and men. But if you suppose that only to be your own, which is your own, and what belongs to others, such as it really is, then no one will ever compel you or restrain you. Further, you will not find fault with others. You will accuse no one. You will do nothing against your will. No one will hurt you. You will have no enemies, and you will not be harmed. So aiming, therefore, at such great things as freedom from disturbance, harm, the tendency to blame others, Remember that you must not allow yourself to be carried even with a slight tendency toward the attainment of lesser things. And how much this sounds like Socrates. And at the end of this work, you see that he references Socrates directly with the highest praise possible. He says Socrates led a perfect life because he abandoned all such lesser things like monetary wealth and prestige and power over others in virtue of reason. Okay? Yes? It seems similar to Eastern philosophy like Buddhism, things like that. Yes, it does. Okay? Buddhism and uh, this is a good occasion to make reference to Eastern ideas, which we aren't going to consider directly here, right? But can anybody state the four noble truths of Buddhism? Just like the philosophical, the philosophical systems of the West, those of the East are perhaps best approached by understanding their basic elements. <clears throat> no disrespect to Eero, which I thought was an outstanding correlation to make. The Four Noble Truths. Number one, there is suffering. It's unavoidable. Now perhaps Epictetus differs here somewhat because he thinks that to a very great extent we can avoid suffering if we can properly distinguish what is within my power from what is not, okay? But even Epictetus, I'm sure, would not say that anybody can be completely free from suffering, okay? So to live is to suffer. But the second noble truth tells us why we suffer. Why do we suffer according to the Buddha? I'm sorry? It is, it is in our nature. Why? It's a very specific reason. All good answers, all relevant answers, okay? But for the Buddha, it boils down, what? Test us? No, not to test us, okay? Because on the Buddhist worldview, which is just 
an unorthodox Hinduist or Hindu view, there is no super being in control of everything. The idea that we are really separate from the world is just an illusion. And, and you know, liberation is achieved in recognizing that I'm actually one with everything, okay? But the second truth tells us why we suffer. Suffering is caused by craving. Attachment. Well, that's similar to, I think he is yeah. saying detached from like your wife or children and you won't be sad when they're gone. Outstanding. That's right. And that sounds awful harsh, doesn't it? Very. Okay. In the section you, you refer to, the first thing he says is if you value a particular ceramic cup. Remember that it is ceramic cups in general that you love, so that when this particular one is taken from you, you won't be disturbed. Likewise, when you kiss your children or your wife or your husband, he doesn't mention, remember that you are dealing with a human being. And it is in the nature of human beings to die. And if you understand that nature, if you understand the real inner nature of things, and don't deceive yourself, then he's not saying that, I think it would be an exaggeration to say that you will absolutely not be disturbed like nothing happened, but you won't be destroyed. You won't be devastated beyond redemption. Okay, so that's a very important passage. And it does sound a lot like Plato. What Plato teaches arising from the theory of forms is that when I value a particular thing, like a beautiful painting, it is not the painting itself that I value, but the beauty reflected by the painting. Likewise, if I come to love another person in the deepest sense, which for Plato is to love a person's mind, I love the virtue in that person. Okay? So for one thing, certainly... What the Buddha means by becoming attached to things sounds very much like what Epictetus means by not focusing on the particular things which you may possess, but on their general nature. Now, one reason why this can help me avoid disturbance when I suffer loss is that I realize that although I've lost this beautiful thing, there is still beauty. Okay? 
But I think we can even take this a step deeper. Because after all, Epictetus is teaching what is basically a Stoic view. Stoicism. And we use the word Stoic in modern parlance all the time. What does it mean to be Stoic? Right. Yeah. It is to, av to avoid histrionics. It is to retain one's equanimity in the face of adversity. It's to weather the storm peacefully. Right? It's to keep a calm demeanor when everything around you is falling apart. Okay? We say that cats are very stoic because they bear their suffering with a certain nobility. Unlike dogs, which will cry and cry and cry. Okay? And it also sounds like Socrates. That if I mistake the real nature of something, then I value what only appears to be good rather than what is really good. Virtue. Okay. The third noble truth of Buddhism, and by the way, I had no intention of talking about Buddhism today, but this is the, this is the way of philosophy. This is how it works. Okay. Suffering can be avoided. Or alleviated. Ah, now we're sounding a lot more like Epictetus. And how? Well, fundamentally, by no longer craving things. But the way we learn not to crave is by following the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. Which is, which consists of behaviors like right thought, right action. And of course, you can, you know, read any generic uh, exegesis of the basic teachings of Buddhism and learn about the Eightfold Path. But the basic idea here is, I think, very much like what Epictetus is teaching us. When I confuse what is not within my power to control for what is in my power to control, that's a form of attachment. I become attached to power, to control itself. And if I want to be liberated from that disturbance, the disturbance caused when things don't go the way I want them to, then what I have to recognize is that what lies outside of my control is nothing to me and should be regarded as nothing to me. Once I have done everything that I can do, 
And of course, Epictetus is not saying, hey, just accept things for what they are and become quiescent. Okay, this is not a doctrine of quietude or complacency. He's not just saying, hey, whatever happens, just accept it. Because if something is in your control, then you ought to take control. You should change what you can change. Okay? But what is outside of my control, if not recognized as such, enslaves me. And this is not an easy thing to learn. And by learn, I mean put into practice. Every time I pick up Epictetus, it's like being reminded of something that I can't believe I have forgotten. Because it's so basic. What, what is one of the most immediate things that I have no power to change, but am constantly wishing that I could? The past. I cannot change what is past. My misdeeds. And to continue to beat myself up over the things that I've done or have failed to do is to inflict suffering upon myself, which is not <coughs> necessary because it's no longer in my power. And all the time that I spend bemoaning the fact that I screwed up is time wasted that could be devoted to a new way, to living differently. And maybe that's what Epictetus is teaching us here, that the, re the real meaning of happiness is freedom. Yes? I kind of got like letting go of like your attachment to perfection because like perfection it doesn't have like a blue thing. You're trying to like reach for something that's unattainable. It's not realistic. You know, just live your life uh, optimistically and that's how you fulfill like whatever your destiny or purpose is as opposed to trying to always fix and correct and things. Yeah. You know, the... The idea that anything can be exactly as I wish it to be is to mistake what is in my control and what is not. I'm trying to think of the passage that pertains directly to that. Mm. Yes? Well, if we believe in predestination, then if it's, what he's saying is contradicts what really predestination is. If you're destined to be this person, then why do you have to worry about what's in your control and what what? Well, have you found, is there evidence in your reading that Epictetus was a determinist? That he thought that everything that happened must happen? It seems to me that he's saying that I do have control over how I think about things. You have, you have responsibility. You have the ability to respond to the situation. Right. 
to make a proper judgment. Okay? Now it may be that, you know, given the way that all seem all things seem to be intertwined, that certain events are just bound to happen. I certainly retain the power of judgment and how to think about it. Again, the Stoic idea is that if we properly understand the real nature of things, we will not suffer when they act according to that nature. Okay. Again, to make a Buddhist reference, and this is an illustration by a Zen master, and I don't want to give credit inappropriately here, but I think either Dogen or someone like that who said something to this effect. Consider this drinking vessel. I'm very fond of it. It's beautiful. When the light shines on it, it reflects all the colors of the rainbow beautifully. If I strike it with my finger, it makes a lovely ringing sound. It holds my drink admirably. It's delightful to drink from. But when I carelessly knock it off of the table and it shatters, I don't cry. I say, of course. Because, in a sense, it was already broken. Because it was, from the start, in the nature of the thing to break. And such is the case with any physical thing, and with people. If you expect that a thing, or a person, will behave contrary to its nature, then you will be disappointed and suffer. And it's difficult because we want to be able to trust people. We want to be able to put our faith in people. And it's, of course, very painful when somebody that you have come to rely upon disappoints you or lets you down or is dishonest with you. But had you remembered from the start that human nature is fallible, that people are imperfect, that no one is perfectly reliable, then you will not be destroyed when a person does exactly what people do, like die. Let me just scroll down here a little bit.
and he's got, it's almost like he's got an aphorism for any situation you might find yourself in. Like, you know, he talks about if you're going to a party, don't draw too much attention to yourself. And if somebody else is being boastful, don't point that out either. Because amongst the things not in my control are the thoughts and actions of other people. Think about this. I am terribly guilty of this. How much time and emotional energy have you spent worrying about how other people think of you? We all do. It's our nature. But I can't do anything about the way other people think of me. Because the way somebody thinks of me has as much to do with how they think about themselves. I can't control that. I can't control what people think or what they do. And if I mistakenly make the judgment that I can control the thoughts and deeds of other people, then I am causing myself to suffer needlessly. There's just so much here. There's a little short one that I want. I don't know if it meant to be good or not, but it was like his response to someone who points out his faults. I love that. And I laughed. I didn't know if that was him making a joke, but I thought it was cool. You want to recount it? I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, say, I would say to the man who points out my faults, uh, he doesn't know me well if, like, if something like if, if he only said those things. Right. He doesn't it, know all my faults. Or right. If, if, you know, if somebody is disparaging me, if somebody is pointing out a particular fault of mine, Laugh about it because if he if he knew yeah. what your real faults were, you would not mention it. Yeah, that this is nothing in comparison to what I've really done, right? <clears throat> Look at this. I like this. This is in, in number five in the bottom. It says an uninstructed person. Okay, somebody who hasn't had any opportunity for this sort of reflection that we're doing today will lay the fault of his own bad condition upon others. And how common is this? I mean, this is to think like a child. And some of us never grow out of this. The easiest way to deal with your own lack of self-esteem or guilt is to find a scapegoat in somebody else. You will meet people who will blame the most ridiculous things on somebody else, no matter how obvious it is that it was no one's fault but their own. Okay. And this is the instinct of a child. Okay. Anybody who has children knows this. If you ask, why did you do that? He made me. 
he, right? He made me talk in class. The next line says, somebody just starting instruction, like a neophyte, not a neophyte, you know, a new initiate into the teaching, will lay the fault on himself. Okay? Suggesting that we gain an insight that, hey, wait a minute, there is, there is some freedom in being able to own your own stuff, to own up to your own shortcomings. But then we take it too far because we think that it brings us praise, that maybe people will think well of me if I'm always willing to take the blame. Hey, look at me. I'm willing to say that it was my fault. But someone who is perfectly instructed will place blame neither on others nor on himself. Why? Because actions and events only have the power to disturb us that we grant them. It is not an event that disturbs us. It's the judgment we make about it. <clears throat> And it's, it's funny how there's always a kind of serendipity about what's happening in my life throughout the course of a semester. Because, of course, when I walked out of my front door on Tuesday to come here and realized that my car was missing, I was freaking. And then I remembered Epictetus. And it helped me, because at that moment, there wasn't a thing I could do about it. And what I could do about it, I had already done. So why sit and fret and worry and cause yourself more anxiety over that which you cannot control? And most of what happens in our lives is beyond our control. What you control is here. Your freedom is up here. That's right. I didn't highlight this, but uh, in number 11 it says, Never say of anything, I have lost it, but rather, I have returned it. Right? What's the error we make in judgment there? Right, that it was ever really yours to possess, because it is not in the nature of things to be permanent. Nobody possesses anything forever. When you die, you lose it all. So what's the difference if it happens now or then? Now, it, it gets very, you know, it, he takes this to such an extreme. He says, is your child dead? It is returned. Is your wife dead? She is returned. Is your estate taken away? Well, and is not that likewise returned? But we'll say he who took it away is a bad man. Well, what difference is it to you who the giver assigns to take it back? While he gives it to you to possess, take care of it. But don't view it as your own, just as a traveler view, views a hotel. Now here it sounds like he's making out know, this 
this is making appeal to some sort of supernatural doctrine, you know, that we are bestowed things for stewardship for a limited amount of time, and then we return them. But remember, you know, if this is published or written in the year 135, I'm no historian, but I, I'm, I do believe that it was just as likely for a parent to outlive a child than not, or as not, much higher mortality rates. Okay, so there was a very good chance that you would lose people close to you because they didn't have cures for simple diseases. Okay. Somebody had something to say? I don't know, I've worried about this for like over a decade probably, and I felt like I've tried to realize what causes my sufferings and what causes me to be stressed out. And most of the time I've realized it is expectations, what you expect out of things, events, people. And I've tried to, you know, reshape my, I've always, my analogy was like I'm trying to rewrite a new operating system for my brain so that I can get to all these new ideas and actually just have them instilled. So some software is up and running, some is still in the works. But more or less, that's like what I've tried to... As, as, as it will continue to be, you know... To, to change desire, to change what you want. The, like any practice, if you want to maintain it, if, you know, if you want to maintain some state of affairs, whether it's health or emotional health, psychological health, or faith, you've got to work at it. It's not like you achieve it and then have it permanently. It takes work. You've got to remind yourself of things constantly. People, people who have faith know this very well, that it's something that you must practice because a single epiphany doesn't last. Okay? It ebbs and flows. Work therefore to be able to say to every harsh appearance you are but an appearance, and not absolutely the thing you appear to be. And if it concerns anything not in our control, be prepared to say that it is nothing to you. And listen to this. This is, I think, what you were getting at. This is number eight. Don't demand that things happen as you wish. But wish that they happen as they do happen. And you will go on well. Sounds like a Sheryl Crow song. <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking... Uh, That soak up the sun song, right? It's not getting what you want, it's wanting what you've got. I think it was a poem. Probably. <laughs> well, I'm not sure <laughs> how much earlier, you know, popular culture references can get then, the second century. In any event, Like do what you can with what you have. Yeah. Speaks All right, listen to this. With every accident, ask yourself what abilities you have for making a proper use of it. 
If you see an attractive person, you will find that self-restraint is the ability you have against your desire. If you are in pain, you will find fortitude. If you hear unpleasant language, you will find patience. And thus habituated, the appearances of things will not hurry you away along with them. So, <clears throat> you know, with, with this consideration of the Enchiridion, it's somewhat of an excursion into ethics and, uh, at worst, perhaps, philosophical self-help. But, um, I love Epictetus because it reminds me that the point of philosophy is a quality of life issue. It's got nothing to do with being able to be crafty and clever and win arguments. It's got to do with learning how to live. 